Brothers and sisters, if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to take them and open them to Genesis chapter 11 and stand with me for the reading of God's holy word. Now our passages in Genesis 1, or 11, 1 through 9, I'm going to go ahead and read the whole chapter, but focus this morning on verses 1 through 9. This is the reading of God's holy word. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over all the face of the earth. These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arpachshad, two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arpachshad 500 years, and he had other sons and daughters. When Arpachshad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. And Arpachshad lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years, and he had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Shelah lived after he had fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years, and he had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Reu. And Peleg lived after he fathered Reu 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Reu had lived 32 years, he fathered Serug. And Reu lived after he fathered Serug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Serug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Serug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he had fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren, she had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Well, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we just pray that you would take your word. Again, some of this sounds so familiar to many of us, Lord, but we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord, what it is you want us to see and hear this morning, and that you would open our minds and our hearts to understand and to receive these things from your hand. And we thank you, Lord, 
for this time. In Jesus' precious, holy, and righteous name, amen. Well, last week we looked at Genesis chapter 10. We looked at the table of nations. And if you remember, there was one name that stood out, and that was the name of Nimrod, who was really the first builder of a kingdom and an empire in history after the flood. And I began thinking this week, as I've been thinking about Nimrod, you know, what are some of the other na- names of great men in history that have done, by the world's standards, great things? in building kingdoms and empires for, for their own glory. And, you know, history is littered with such names. We can think of Nebuchadnezzar later on in biblical history, the founder of the kingdom uh, of the Neo-Babylonians in the 500s B.C. and all the things that he did. I think of Daniel chapter 4 when he walks out and he's looking on the city of Babylon and he's glorying to himself. And he says, look at this amazing city that I have built with my own hands. I think of men down the the line of history like Alexander the Great, the son of Philip II, king of Macedon, who before he was 33 years old, had conquered much of the known world at that time from Greece all the way to India and toppling the Persian Empire before he died at the age of 33 in Babylon. Or Julius Caesar or his adopted heir Octavian, who we would know from the New Testament as Caesar Augustus the founder of the Roman Empire. It was Caesar who took power to himself and brought an end to the Roman Republic and establishes the Roman Empire to which his heir Octavian had become the first Roman emperor. An empire that would span three continents and rule the lives of millions and millions of people for about four centuries. What about Napoleon Bonaparte of France, conquering much of Europe only to be stopped by the harsh climate and winter in Russia where his army was stopped and because of starvation and cold was forced back. What is it that many of these men have in common as you think about history? You can probably boil it down to One word, or maybe two, pride, ambition. But that's what characterizes these men, isn't it? The great men of the world are characterized by pride that drives them to the excesses that we know them for in history. Well, we see some of that in our passage this morning. We know from Genesis chapter 10 that we we see kind of the foundation of all the nations, not just in the ancient world, but those nations which have given rise to the nations that we have in the modern world. Each of these nations has their own history, their own stories that make their people the way that they are. You know, but it was not always that way, was it? There was a time before all these nations had their histories and their stories and their myths that make them who they are. And the question we ask this morning is, how did they get this way? Well, we, by and large, get the answer to that in our passage this morning in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. And, and if I had to summarize the point of this passage in one crisp statement, it would be this. Pride is at the heart of all sinful rebellion against God, which merits his response of judgment, and yet it shows his grace. By the way, if you're visiting with us this morning and you don't know this, you can find that sermon idea right under the liturgy in your bulletin. But that's a pretty simple idea. Pride is at the heart of all sinful rebellion against God, which merits his response of judgment, and yet it shows his grace. That's the idea we want to unpack as we work through this story this morning. And I want to begin in verses 1 through 4, looking at our first point, judgment for rebellion. And if you look at verses 1 and 2, what you see is you see the situation that is ripe for rebellion. 
Take a look at those verses again with me. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. What you find in those two verses is the setting of the story. And there are multiple details we want to pay attention to. The first thing I want to just draw your attention to, you don't see it in the narrative, but you see it in the genealogy. If you were to do the math in the genealogy from verse 10 all the way to 32, you find the ages and the names and how old each person was when they had their children as we read through. When you do the math, what you find is this story happens roughly 100 years after the flood. Maybe you ask, well, how, how did you come to that? Well, if you go back to our genealogy or our table of nations from last year, we saw um, under the descendants of Shem, there was highlighting the person Eber who bore two sons, the name of one of his sons. I'm looking at verse 25 of chapter 10. The name of one of his sons was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Well, the division that he's taught referring to there is the division that we see in our passage this morning. Now, we, we can't narrow down the exact date when this happened, but sometime during Peleg's lifetime is when the Tower of Babel and this city is built, and all of this takes place. And when you do the math, you find that this is about 100 years after the flood. This is the situation that is ripe for rebellion. Verse 1 says the whole earth had one language and the same words. Now, this really would have been the case, if you think about it, from the time of Adam. The time of Adam to Noah was ten generations, ten generations of all humanity speaking the same language, the same dialect. And I think that word dialect is really a great way to translate that word, the same words, the same dialect. Because we might have the same language, but you might speak a different dialect of the same language and get confusing, right? I remember years ago when I went to England, I went to England twice when I was in college, uh, both for two weeks and stayed with the family there. And I'm, I'm going to spare you the stories right now. You can ask me later. Uh, there are many times I embarrass myself saying something that meant something to Americans that to English people meant something different, you know. Same language, different dialect. But here, what you find is they're one and the same. They're one and the same. It had been that way since Adam and Eve. And it enabled history, uh, humanity throughout that short time of history to be united. Now, that, that's really interesting because today in our day and age, we tend to think of being united and having unity as the chief virtue, the chief value. Even among Christians, don't we? We tend to highlight unity and sometimes at the expense of truth. But in this particular passage, what we find, we find a challenge to the idea that unity is really the summum bonum or, or the, the ultimate good that we should be striving to. And it's for the reason that this unity is driven by the fuel of sinful motives and intentions. Unity is only as good as the... the motives and intentions that drive it. And we find here in this passage, they don't have motives that are pure or intentions that are clean. They're sinful. And our passage this morning illustrates what this clearly looks like. Because we don't just see a linguistic situation of unity. Now we see a geographical situation in verse 2. This is the other part of the setting. People migrated from the east. They found a plain named Shine in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. Now think about it. When, when, when he says they're migrating from the east, this is from the perspective of Moses and Israel, where they're in the desert somewhere south of the Holy Land. This is east of them. They had come out uh, of, of the ark, which had rested on Mount Ararat, and they moved and found a plain, which we know is in southern Mesopotamia. And if you read all of the ancient sources, they don't call it Shinar. They call it Sumer, but it's the same place. And this, what we find here, is they dwell or they settle there. Now, what's the problem with this? 
Because this is really kind of the beginning of the problem. It's not the whole problem, it's the beginning of it. They settle in this place. Well, if you go back to Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, God had commanded them, be fruitful, multiply, and do what? Fill the earth. Which implies, if they're going to fill the earth, they're going to do what? Spread out. They're going to disperse. But here we find them doing the opposite, and they know that what they're doing is the opposite of what God commanded. Now again, it it, it just strikes me that 100 years after the flood, 100 years after God judges the earth, 100 years after God wipes out all of humanity, 100 years after, uh, after their ancestors had received God's mercy and grace, they are in rebellion. They had not spread out. And their decision to do this, they know, is the opposite of what God's word had commanded them to do. And so that is the beginning of their rebellion. Their rebellion starts when they choose to do contrary to what God's word had commanded them. Now this rebellion kind of leads to to decisions that are going to be made, which we see in verses 3 through 4. These decisions are laid out in terms of exhortations. And so in verses 3 through 4, you see the exhortations that lead to this rebellion. Take a look at verse 3 and then the beginning of verse 4 with me once again. And they said to one another, when they choose to settle there, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. We'll stop there. Those are really two two exhortations, aren't they? But they really are grouped in the same way. Come, let us make bricks. Why do we want to make bricks? Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower. Now, this is interesting because this is the first city that humanity would have built after the flood, historically speaking. And now, it doesn't really, I wouldn't say there's anything necessarily wrong with building a city, but... We've been working our way through Genesis all this time, and what this should do is trigger in our memory, as we've read through this before, uh, the memory of Cain and what Cain and his descendants did back in Genesis chapter 4. They began to build cities where people began to congregate. And you remember what Cain's descendants uh, started to do in those cities at the end of Genesis chapter 4. They began to build weapons of war and, and spread violence and corruption over the face of the earth so that when we get to Genesis chapter 6, particularly verses 1 through 4, we see the, the net result of this rebellion. The whole earth had become corrupt. And we saw that that resulted in the flood and the judgment of God. And so when we see them say this here, we know that they're they're ignoring what God's word says and rebelling against it by staying in one place. And then they say, let's build a city and a tower. This should trigger in our minds that, oh no, (laughs) this is probably not going to end very well for these people. And so... We see history repeating itself. Now, the idea of building a tower is not necessarily sinful in and of itself. Maybe you read that and you're thinking, I don't know, what's what's so bad about building a tower? It's not the fact of building a tower. It's what the tower represents or signifies that is rebellious. The tower represents humanity's united rebellion against God. Now, it may help you to know just a little bit of the history behind towers and buildings like this in the ancient Near East. This tower would have been what what people called a ziggurat back then. If you don't know what a ziggurat is, it's basically like the same shape as a pyramid. And it went up and had a pinnacle. But maybe a little different than a pyramid, it, it had a staircase on the side of it that could, you could climb and get to the top. 
Actually, I'll give you an interesting example of this. You know, if you ever look at pictures online of, of Mayan ruins, you can still see some of these. They, they call them ziggurats, even in Central America. And you, even when you look at those pictures, you see there's, there's like a staircase along the side where the priests could climb to the top and offer the sacrifices to their gods. And that, that's exactly what this is here. That's what kind of tower they're talking about. They're not talking about like a tower, like a modern day skyscraper that just goes straight up into the sky. There's a purpose to this tower, to this structure. And the purpose you can see in the description here with its tops in the heavens. That's key to understanding why this tower signifies rebellion against God. Because in their pride, in their arrogance, in their hubris, humanity thought that they could ascend to the heavens where the gods dwelt and that they could do so on their own sinful terms. Actually, what you're seeing here is you're seeing the same heart attitude express itself uh, that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. What was the whole idea of, of eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What was the lie? Remember what Satan said? God knows that in the day that you eat of it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That was the idea. That is, that is what is at the heart of this rebellion, the desire, the drive, the pride, the ambition to be like God. And these ziggurats, these ziggurats historically, at least in ancient Mesopotamia, were thought to be the gateways between heaven and earth and were a means by which the gods might descend and assemble with men and men might ascend to assemble with the gods. That was the mentality. That was the world view at the time. Now, interestingly enough, centuries later, you see God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, judging the arrogance of the king of Babylon in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, when he says this. He, God says, You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven Above the stars of God, and I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the most high. Now, when somebody takes that kind of pride and arrogance and ambition to his logical end, what they're attempting to do they're attempting to make a claim that they are the ones who determine what reality is. They are the ones who get to determine what is right and wrong in terms of like being true and false and what is morally good and evil. That's what these people are attempting to do. They are attempting to create the world as they see fit based on their own sinful motives. This is the rebellious pride that's being expressed here. And it goes forward at the end of verse 4. It's not just that they're, they're looking to build a tower to become like gods themselves, to determine reality and what is true and false and what is right and wrong morally. It goes further than that. Look at the end of verse 4. This is the third and final exhortation. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Boy, that shows pride and arrogance. It shows that it leads to ambition, doesn't it? Now, what's the nature of this ambition? To make a name for themselves. You know, the last time we saw any kind of language like that in Genesis was actually back in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. And if you have your, if you have your Bible open, you can turn back a page or two and you can look at what that says. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. That phrase, men of renown, men who had a name, a name for themselves, a reputation because of their violence, 
their pride, their ambition. We see the same heart here, a hundred years after the flood. Now, is it, is it sinful in and of itself to have a name? No, not really. Well, how do you know that? Well, if you go forward one chapter to Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, God promises to make Abraham's name great. And then you go even further in biblical history, 2 Samuel Chapter 7, verse 9, God is making a covenant promise to David as king to establish his throne forever. And he promises that he will make David's name great. So where does the rebellion come? What is so sinful about what these people are doing? Well, they're seeking to assert themselves and make their own name great. That's very different than allowing God to exalt you at the proper time. One is a heart of humility, waiting for the Lord to fulfill his promises to you. The other is the presumption that you can take for yourself what belongs only to God. So the question we have to ask ourselves this morning as we take a step back from the story and look to apply this to our own lives, how does pride and ambition work in our own hearts today? Because that's really what this is about. Pride and ambition is something that every one of us deals with very deep down, if we're honest. And I would hope that we're all honest in this room. We all have this struggle. And it has the power to blind us to the grace of God that we all have a need of. Now, I want you to think about that. Pride is related to the way that you view God. The heart of all rebellion, the heart of all sin, boils down to a spirit of pride deep within us. Now this challenges the way we think today because most of us are encouraged today to nurture a a selfish ambition and to make a name for ourselves. I mean, some of us want to climb the corporate ladder of the professional world or whatever profession you have and make a name for your own reputation. By the way, there is a healthy way to do that. I'm not saying that all ambition is bad. What I'm asking here, and what I think this passage is driving us to, is is asking what is the foundational motive and intention behind your ambition? Most of us do not make the decision to pursue something with ambition with the glory of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in our minds. Most of us are looking after our own name and reputation. You know, sadly, you see this, you see this everywhere. You see this even in the church. You see this even in the pulpit, don't you? How many pastors out there do you know of who have been busted for one scandal or another and the whole scandal was based on scaffolding their own platform and their own name only to come crashing down because for whatever they were doing that was not honest to make themselves look good, they got caught. It's not just in the church, it's, it's in the world. Most of us do not stop and think about what our pride says about how we view who God is in our relationship to him. I want you to think about that. Pride is just simply clearly thinking more highly of oneself than we ought to do. It's an overinflated sense of our ego. But maybe we need to be encouraged this morning that the things that we do pursue... Again, it is healthy to have an ambition to pursue certain things in life, but do you pursue it for the the sake of your own name, or do you pursue it for the sake of the name and the glory of Jesus Christ? Because there are people that pursue their careers and do a wonderful job, you know, in the work that God's called them to do, whether it's a construction worker, a banker, a teacher someone who works in the medical field, they do their job to the glory of Christ. And they want to do their best, and that's, that's the aim of their ambition. That's not a bad ambition. 
but it shows where their priorities are. It shows that they see God and his glory as more important than who they are. And it's something I think we all need to ask ourselves. And I think secondly, just as the people in this narrative were willing to disregard and disobey God's word for the sake of serving their own ambition and reputation, we need to, we, we do this today oftentimes. And the question I want you to ask yourself this morning is this. What am I willing to do that might be contrary to God's word in order to get ahead in life? That's a really interesting question. In order to get ahead, in order to establish yourself in whatever it is you see that you want to pursue in this world, what is it you're willing to disregard and disobey God's commands and his word to get there? Because that will say a lot about where your heart really is. Maybe you're willing to lie in that report to make your boss think better of you to secure the raise that you really want this year. Or maybe, maybe you're a student and you're willing to use AI and cheat <laughs> to write a paper to make yourself look really good and get a good grade so you don't lose a scholarship. Look, I, I, I can multiply examples and uh, we don't need to. The question is when you're, will, when you're willing to put your own interests before the glory of God in your life, that is the moment that your ambition takes on a character of rebellion against God that you need to be aware of and that you need to check. Because at the end of the day, when, when we are blind to our own pride, and b- believe me, pride does blind. When we are blinded by our own pride, we are blinded to the fact that all of us have a need for the grace of God in our lives. That's what these people forgot in that story. It had been a hundred years since the flood. And how quickly the memory of disaster and judgment and salvation for their ancestors and their family through Noah and his three sons, how quickly they forgot their need for God's grace and how quickly they ran back to the same problems that led to the judgment and the flood in the first place. They failed to grasp their need for God's grace. Does that speak to you this morning? Maybe you're sitting here and you have forgotten why you need God's grace. And that that applies especially to those of us who are in the church and who have been walking with the Lord for any any you know, amount of time. It's easy to have been saved for so long that you, you, forget to, you forget who you really were before you got saved. And you forget why you needed grace. This passage is meant to be the mirror to our souls to show us the reflection of our own hearts. That without Christ, we are rooted in pride, selfish ambition, and blinded to the need for grace. Now the passage doesn't end here, does it? It goes on. In verses 5 through 7, we see our second point, judgment that addresses rebellion. We see the context of judgment in our first point. Now we see how that is addressed by the Lord. And it's addressed very ironically in verses 5 and 7. There is an ironic response to this. I want you to look at verse 5. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. And then the beginning of verse 7 kind of re- reiterates that point. Um, God says, Come, let us go down. And you're, why, is, why is that ironic? Well, there's an irony of contrasting glory going on here. Particularly in verse 5, the irony is the people are building something to ascend to the heavens so that they can be in the place of God himself, being little gods themselves. And what does God say? For all that they've built up, all that they've, they've done to ascend to glory, God still has to say, let us go down. Do you see that irony there? They're building up only for God to have to come down. Now, it's not because God couldn't see from heaven, okay? Please don't press the literalness there too far. It's making a point. And the way that Moses wrote that is designed to highlight mockery. Please don't miss that. God mocks human pride. 
That's what this is after. That's what it's, even the greatest hubris of human pride does not come close to reaching where God is. Their best efforts is a mockery to the glory of God. So there's irony in contrasting glory here. Verse 7, the irony is in the judgment as well. Take a look at the rest of verse 7. Sometimes God's justice is just so precise, okay? Verse 7, come, let us go down, and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. God's judgment here dots every I, it crosses every T. And let me tell you what I mean, because very literally. Do you realize the word for confuse in Hebrew? And the word for bricks that we saw back in verse 3 when they said, come let us make bricks. In Hebrew, those two words have the exact same consonants backwards. This is like man saying, I am God. And God looking down and saying, no, you're a dog. (laughs) It's the same letters, only backwards. What an incredibly precise judgment. In the way that he's confusing their language, what he's doing is he's getting at the heart of, behind their rebellion. He's turning their plans on its head. And the way Moses wrote that, a Hebrew or a Hebrew speaking Jewish audience who would have heard that for the very first time would have understood the play on words like, oh my gosh, what an idiot. But, you know, by the way, God has such a sense of humor. I'm not going to get into all the examples because I'm not going to subject you to all that right now. But if you actually read the Old Testament in Hebrew, there are so many times in God's judgment, he is mocking the people. Okay, I'll give you one. (laughs) I can't help myself. When Samson has the jawbone of a donkey and he kills a thousand men. You remember that story in Judges 14? Um, The Holy Spirit comes upon him. He breaks his bonds. He grabs the the jawbone. You you know what the old King James says? You know the jawbone of an ass, right? Using old archaic English. Do you realize that, you know, when he's hitting them and he's whacking them and he's, he's slaughtering them and You know, he then finishes and he says something very poetic. You know, heaps upon heaps with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, I have slain my enemies. Well, do you realize that, you know, the word jawbone of an ass and heaps are the same word? And the the, the real sarcastic wordplay going on there in God's judgment through Samson is that those who exalt themselves above God and his people, God will make an ass of them. <laughs> you see that here. He turns the plan on his head. He confuses their language. And by the way, confusing their language addresses the problem that you saw in verse 1 Because it is the language that is the means to their rebellion against God. Now, I want you to to really think about this. When it talks about he confuses their language, there's more than meets the eye here. He's not talking about just changing the fundamental sounds of words coming out of these people's mouths. There is far more meaning to language than most of us tend to think. Jesus gets at this in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. Why? For out of the abundance of his heart, the mouth speaks. What is it that language conveys? Language conveys the meaning and the intentions of the heart. Think about that. Commentators Kyle and Dalich say this. If language is the audible expression of emotions, concepts, and thoughts of the mind, 
The cause of the confusion or division of the one human language into different national dialects must be sought in an effect produced upon the human mind by which the original unity of emotion, conception, thought, and will was broken up. Boy, that's a mouthful. No pun intended. By which the original unity of emotion, conception, thought, and will was broken up. It never ceases to amaze me when, I, when, I, when you talk to people who, you know, they have a different primary language than you. It's not just them learning a new language and putting new words. It's, it's learning new concepts. I see this because, you know, half of my family speaks Spanish and the other half speaks English. And while they may learn to communicate in a way that understands one another with the words... There are always concepts that are unique that are carried in each language that don't quite transfer to the other language. One, a person's primary language will tell you a lot about the inner workings of their hearts and the way that things are processed emotionally, intellectually, there are things, there's a reason the New Testament is written in Greek rather than Hebrew. Hebrew is much more fluid. It's much more poetic. It flows. The word plays are artistic. You see something very similar in Arabic. But Greek is very precise. It's very logical. German is the same way very precise. And then you look at the way, I, I don't mean to be stereotypical here, but you look at the way people from some of those cultures can come across. Germans can come across as very, very stern and austere sometimes and emotionless. It's not that they don't have emotion. It's just that they're processing that emotion differently. That has a lot to do with their language. What God is doing here in this particular judgment, they had a united language, which meant that there was a unity of emotion, there was a unity of will, there was a unity of thought conception, and a unity in rebellion. What God does is he breaks up that rebellion at the deepest fundamental level within humanity. And so that this is what God is doing. He divides the unity of their resolve to rebel at the most fundamental level imaginable. Why does he do that? Well, verse 6, you see why. There's an urgency in his response to this rebellion. Look at verse 6. Behold, this is what God says, Behold, they are one people, and they have all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. Understand what God is saying. If this is the beginning of their rebellion, their rebellion is going to go further. It's going to get worse. The sins of the fathers pass on to the next generation, as Scripture will tell us. Boy, if this is only the beginning and they are all united in this. Now, I, this is my imagination, but I'm thinking God must have been thinking, I just promised not to destroy the world with a flood once again. And they're doing the exact same thing they did before the flood. What am I going to do? Okay, that's not how God thinks, but you get the point. I'm trying to get the urgency across. And so he did something that judged sin at the root of its rebellion. Now the question is, how does this show us God's view of our pride, our ambition, and our rebellion today? Well, our passage reveals how little God regards the things that men and women put their selfish pride in. And I want to make this point very clearly. God will not honor human pride. 
I think the irony of him come, having to come down to see the lofty achievements of human pride is meant to show us that God will mock the pride of men. And you're wondering, well, okay, but that may be a stretch. How are you getting that from that passage? Well, okay, I'll look at, let's look at another passage. In Psalm chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the world seeks to rebel against the Lord and his anointed. This is what it says. The kings of the earth set themselves against the rulers, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. That's what you're seeing in Genesis 11. But look at the very next verse. Psalm 2.4 gives God's response to this. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. You could translate that Hebrew word, the Lord mocks them in their rebellion. He mocks the things that we are willing to usurp and put in his place on our behalf. And in time, God will always show that the things that we're trusting on in our pride are in fact nothing to boast about. God does not humor the proud by playing their game of self-delusion and deception and their delusions of grandeur. This is why the Apostle James tells us in James 4, 6-7, and then verse 10, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. It's just like what he said he would do to Abraham and to David in making them a name, a great name. Peter, in 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6, I'm so sad that Jared is not here because he's, he's teaching through 1 Peter. I would have given him a nod to this, but he's not here. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Why? For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's the principle, so what do you do with it? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. So here's what I want you to ask yourself this morning. Ha have you humbled yourself before the Lord? Or maybe better yet, will you search your heart and humble yourselves before him? Or does he have to do it for you? Because one is much more preferable than the other. How do you humble yourself before the Lord? Well, you begin by repenting of your sin. The flip side of that, you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that really leads us to our last point this morning, judgment that shows grace. You know, there is grace to be seen in this passage in verses 8 and 9. Let's look at the grace that God does has in dispersing the nations in verse 8. So the Lord dispersed from them there over all the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Now, I think that's interesting. It presupposes they already finished completing the tower, but finishing the city was not yet complete. And the net result is, is very simple. They, they've been dispersed over all the face of the earth. Everything we see in Genesis chapter 10 with the tables of nations and all these nations being separated in their clans and their families and their lands and their language, all of that is because of this. Verse 8. This is what God did. And it's interesting because you can see the parallel to what God did to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, which, by the way, geographically is roughly in the same place as the plain of Shinar. What did God do? In Genesis chapter 3, when man had sinned and fallen, he exiled them out of the garden. And I know when you read that, it looks like a mean gesture on God's part. But remember what it did. 
It prohibited them from eating of the tree of life so that they would live together in a state of sin uh, forever, in a sin, uh, state of sin and separation. It, basically, God is protecting them so that he can lavish his grace on them at a later time. That's exactly what this, this dispersing, dispersing and scattering the peoples is meant to accomplish. It is for their own good. It leaves them open to receiving his gracious and redemptive activity as a gift later on. And then you see, well, how, did, how is that? Well, look at verse 9. This grace anticipates redemption. Verse 9. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. You know, that dispersion there leads right into the genealogy of Shem that I'm not going to go through right now, and you're probably going to thank me later for not doing that. But what does Shem's descendants lead to? If you were to go through those names verse by verse, you'll notice there's ten names between Shem, and they all lead to Abraham. And when we get next week to chapter 10, we're not going to be focusing on the judgment on the nations. We're going to be focusing on the hope of the nations. Because that's what Abraham leads to. God calls, out of all the nations that are dispersed in their various languages that we see here, God will call one man in Abraham out of those nations, out of Ur of the Chaldeans. And in that one man, he will promise to make one nation. And with that one nation, he will bring forth one king. And from that one king, God will bring blessing to all the nations and all the languages. That's what this judgment and dispersion is meant to point us to. It's not judgment for the sake of judgment. It's not judgment, end of the story. It's judgment for the sake of redemption and grace. And so how is God's grace in the midst of this judgment ultimately fulfilled? What we see in this, the principle of grace coming out of judgment, and that is a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ itself. When the Lord judges the people by confusing their languages and sending them into exile and dispersing them over the globe, it points to another exile, it points to another judgment, and that judgment is none other than the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You realize that in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12 in the New Testament, it says that Jesus was crucified outside of the city in exile, as it were. And it is through the judgment that Christ endured on the cross that those of us who have rebelled, that those of us who are prideful, who have tried to usurp what belongs to God in our own lives, who have sinned against him, it is in that judgment that mercy can be shown and grace rather than condemnation. I want you to think about that. His judgment on the cross was greater than the judgment in our passage this morning at Babel. Because Babel was the judgment on the nations. But the judgment of the cross on, of Christ was a judgment that was put on Christ on behalf of the nations to bring blessing to them that was promised. And that blessing is the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Because you get, to the, you get to all those names in verses 10 through 32 in, in chapter 11 of Genesis, and they all end the same way, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. What's the blessing? Forgiveness of sin, eternal life. And secondly, just as God dispersed the people for the purpose of blessing them by confusing their language, we can see the beginning of, of God's blessing in the New Testament where the issue of confusion by language was reversed. Why do you think we read Acts chapter 2 earlier? <laughs> That's what that was about. The Holy Spirit came down on 120 believers in Jerusalem initially and they spoke in tongues. Tongues. 
And it was there that Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, the visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, all heard the gospel in their own language and then brought that back. How about that? Just as God judged these nations by scattering them in their languages, God now freely gives his gospel that goes out to all languages and nations. And what? To build their names? To make a name for them? No. For the name and the glory of Jesus Christ. What does Acts chapter 4 say? There is no name given among men under heaven by which men must be saved except for that of Jesus Christ. What does Paul say in Philippians chapter 2? That at the name of Jesus. What does it say? The name of Jesus. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Brothers and sisters, it is in the name above all names that we will find the blessing of God in his promises and that we will find a name for ourselves one day given to us in eternity. What eluded the nations at Babel will be freely given to us when we humbly submit ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ through faith and repentance. That brings us right back full circle to our main idea, doesn't it? Pride is at the heart of all sinful rebellion against God which merits his response of judgment. But there is still grace to be found. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, each and every one of us in this room, in one way, shape, or form, has sinned in the way that these people sinned in this particular passage. We have been prideful. We have been arrogant. We've had an ambition that is characterized by sin and selfishness. And yet, Lord, we thank you that you offer grace to sinners like us. We're not perfect. None of us in this room can pretend to be, O oh Lord. And so, Lord, we humble ourselves before you this morning. And we ask, O oh Lord, that as we do so, that you would exalt us at the proper time, as your word says in both James 4 and 1 Peter 5. Lord, we cling to these promises as we go forth today. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would take your word, write it on our hearts, transform us, make us new people with new purpose, new resolve, a new identity as we look forward to the day when you return to bring us to yourself. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, with that...